proof positive that uh, death does not separate people who have crossed that line from people who have not crossed that line because clearly owner's introduction was written by my mother who passed away uh, many years ago. It's uh, a pleasure uh, to be in Istanbul, one of my top ten cities of the world. Uh, you know, west and east is separated by the Bosporus, the Sea of Marmara, and the Dardanelles, and Istanbul spans east and west. And once again, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my friends are from Turkey, Turkey, one of the great countries of the world that span uh, centuries. That um, You know, my favorite thing about Turkey, come on, uh, is that when you conquered other countries, you didn't destroy their churches. You said that they could worship the way they wish, you know. Hasn't been true of every conqueror in the world. And uh, Kamal and uh, Ona are two of my favorite Turks. Uh, Sonier is uh, not here, I guess, huh? Too bad, another one of my favorite Turks. How about your parents, are they here? They're not here either. Later, They'll be here later, two of my other favorite uh, Turks. Uh, Owner uh, mentioned so many things. Uh, my hand-drawn figures uh, remains a uh, issue uh, with Wenmei even to this day. Uh, the first it was the first HPS papers uh, published in uh, 1985. 1985. That's what. That's 31 years ago. And uh, I was 21 years old at the time. So at the age of minus 14 is when we started the HPS work. Uh, the hand-drawn figures, and when they insisted that we should use his software package from uh, uh, Apple called MacDraw. If you ever use MacDraw, you'll notice that the figures are so ugly. You know? and I said, if I couldn't do better than that, then uh, I'd give it up. And you guys, you keep poking fun at me with uh, I'm surprised that you didn't show the uh, uh, the, the uh, hand-drawn uh, figures that are in the, uh, I guess, uh, proceedings of uh, Michael. <coughs> what else do I want to say when I get, before I get started? Uh, yeah, so <coughs> I have been lucky. Students like uh, Wendy and Owner, I, my, my guess is that if you're as bad as I am, you need people like Wendy and Owner to just uh, keep you propped up. In fact, uh, you mentioned the uh, the precise exceptions, which is, there were many things in HPS, you know, on motor execution, uh, started with, um, uh, with the Thomas Lou album, uh, and then they just dropped. In fact, uh, IBM had to get special permission to release that product because it violated uh, the ISA. So here you had a uh, implementation that could not faithfully execute instructions written in that ISA. And so uh, Armok uh, had to give uh, IBM permission uh, to actually release that product. Did you know that, Kamal? Yeah. yeah. Kamal used to be a giant at IBM uh, Watson. Watson is the uh, research center that you have in New York rather than that silly program that is supposed to be able to think that people talk about. Anyhow, <coughs> HPS had many things about it that contributed to performance. You know, wide issue, branch prediction, uh, the breaking of instructions into microops, which was done 10 years before uh, Intel and, a and AMD, uh, discovered, <coughs> the discovery that if you have an instruction that's more than one operation, you really ought to break it into microops and have a data flow graph of that instruction. Uh, but I think the central idea in all the work that we did, and the work was done, by the way, since owner introduced it, I guess I will continue, uh, with uh, by me and three of my students, when they, uh, Mike Shevenow and Steve Melvin, I think the thing that made the difference and made it adopted by industry was the fact that it could handle precise exceptions. And that was the basis of when they thesis. So, Again, you know, my students keeping me propped up, you know, 
And uh, I gotta keep getting good students in order to stay that way. Otherwise, I'll have to retire, and I certainly don't wanna do that. Uh, okay, so uh, enough of uh, uh, introduction. I do have a couple of things I wanna say. I titled my talk this morning, Performance Equals Bandwidth Divided by Latency. And of course, you know that equation is nonsense. There's no such equation. So uh, I guess if I hit this, it'll move forward. Yeah. So why this title, since it's not accurate? Uh, the real equation, as everybody in this room knows, is that performance is one divided by the number of instructions executed uh, times the uh, cycles per instruction times the cycle time. And I reduced that to uh, bandwidth divided by latency. Uh, so where does bandwidth and latency come in? Well, the number of instructions executed, performance is one divided by one of those three factors is the number of instructions executed. And if you increase the bandwidth, that means that you're executing more instructions in uh, one unit of time. So in fact, uh, I might quickly augment that equation to, to take that instructions in step say instructions per width that you can execute those instructions. And that's the bandwidth. And then that bandwidth, which is instructions per, then goes up in the nominal in the numerator. And so I've now got performance equals bandwidth divided by uh, CPI times cycle time. And CPI is the number of cycles uh, that each instruction takes which is clearly a measure of latency. How long does it take to do the job? Now, we do all kinds of fancy things in microarchitecture, some of the things I'm gonna talk about this morning. But the, uh, the net effect of that is to uh, deal with CPI. In fact, when we first came up with pipelining, uh, what did we accomplish? Well, we changed the CPI so that instead of instructions taking all the cycles that it takes from when you fetch until you deliver the results. With pipelining, the CPI is going down to like, if you didn't have any branches, you know, which is kind of an ugliness of uh, uh, computer processing as we have these, these uh, problematic instructions called branches. If we didn't have branches, then the CPI would be one. You just stream those instructions through one after the other. If it would be pipeline, CPI goes to one. We reduce latency, okay? Uh, time cycle time. So the equation then becomes, in fact, what I should do is like the physicists do with, uh, they don't say F equals MA, mass and acceleration are the important characteristics. They say F equals K of A. And so this other stuff will become number of instructions. That's part of the K. So I'll change my equation to performance equals K times bandwidth divided by uh, latency. So why do I waste your time with this? This is a supercomputer conference. Uh, one of those supercomputers. In fact, the conference that started by uh, Dave Cook, you know, many years ago. And has had, uh, in fact, I think you invited me to give my first paper in this conference. In the sister, so it was held in the sister country of Turkey. You know, it's called Greece. And in fact, I went downstairs yesterday, asked for a cup of Greek coffee. You know, sketo? But they would only serve me serve Turkish coffee. <laughs> Not realizing that they were the same thing, of course. Uh, Supercomputing seems to be concerned about bandwidth. They don't seem to really worry about latency the way I would uh, argue. And again, my equation, bandwidth divided by latency, both are equally important. You look at the top 500, and what's it all about? It's about bandwidth. You know, if you want to do impact with an enormous number of silliness, you just add more cores. And if you want to get into this top 500, I guess the biggest problem they have is cooling, right? How come there's no, ah, Trimsa in northern Norway, in the Arctic Circle, that's where they should uh, put their supercomputer because you can have more and more cores there and not worry about the cooling. The preoccupation with bandwidth just, uh, to me, it's been, I don't know, pretty <coughs> discouraging because it just, it's more, but how do you use that? 
fact, I remember in uh, one of the other supercomputing conferences a few years ago, they asked me to uh, deal with the issue of supposing I have uh, 50 billion transistors on a chip. 50 billion transistors, and we will. Five, six years from now, we're going to have 50 billion transistors on a chip, it's clear. Already we have more than 5 billion, and uh, you know, at some point, Moore's Law is going to run out of steam. There's no question about that. You can't have the feature size less than the size of an electron. That's silly also. So eventually, we're going to run out of steam. What we're going to do then is not clear to me. We've got 3D that'll help us for a little bit, but eventually we'll run out of steam. Um, but 50 billion transistors on a chip, and the, the session chair said, you know, with 50 billion transistors on a chip, we could put 10 million cores on the chip. Wow, supercomputer, 10 million cores. So you say, now wait a minute, so you've got 50 billion transistors, and what you're gonna do with those 50 billion transistors is put 10 million cores. Well, 50 billion divided by 10 million. And I learned, you know, when I was about this high, and my father taught me arithmetic. You know, 50 divided by 10, that's five. And billion divided by million, that's thousand. So you're going to have 50 billion transistors on the chip, and you're going to have each one of those cores is going to be 5,000 transistors. So we've got all that technology advanced over the last, what was the first uh, chip, 1971? That's what? That's uh, 71, 81, 91, 01. That's 45 years ago. And what we're going to do with that chip is we're going to put 10 million Intel 4004s. But this preoccupation with bandwidth, you know, is uh, in, my, in my view absurd. By the way, the other thing interesting about that 10 million <coughs> core chip is uh, how are they gonna talk together, talk to each other, you know? There's no room for transistors to interconnect, so I guess by mental telepathy or something is the way that it works. So you continually get constantly that, you know, more is better without worrying about the other side, which I think is, uh, is equal which is latency. And whose job is it anyway to worry about latency? Well, the answer is the job of every one of us. And some of you may have heard me talk before, so you've seen this slide before. Or uh, you may have heard somebody talk who wants to make fun of me, in which case you've seen this slide before. This slide reflects the fact that every one of us who cares about supercomputing may not all of us care about the hardware uh, or the compiler or the algorithm or the circuits that drive it. We care about one of the elements here and the hope is that what we care about can improve performance in a supercomputer. Supercomputer, supercomputer to me is fascinating because if handled right, the supercomputer is not about doing Microsoft Word faster. You know, I can't type billions of characters per second. It's about curing cancer or predicting tsunamis before they hit. That's what supercomputers are all about. And it requires the efforts of everybody in this room, whether you're describing problems, coming up with algorithms for those problems. In fact, one of the problems with these computers is that we deal with this abstract level, the algorithm, for example. But what's really solving the problem are the electrons down at the bottom. And if I could speak electron, then it'd be easy. I'd go up to the computer and I'd go, computer, electrons, solve this problem. Right? And the electrons, if they spoke, well, if I spoke electron, they have no problem understanding, and they would go off and do it. I don't speak English. I'm what they call a monolingual person, otherwise known as an American. And the electrons can't speak English. So what I have to do is go through all these layers, and in each layer, from the statement of the problem to the design of the algorithm to the programming it in some mechanical language, in fact the language people have to sign up, all the way down to the circuits 
which establish a potential difference that allows the electrons to go from one potential to another. All those layers are required to solve these problems. And so each one of us has a part. So what I thought I would do in the two or three minutes remaining is talk about what some of the things where latency is important in order to get more and more performance. And even though, as you see here, I've listed them in layers, algorithm layer, language layer, compiler layer, architecture layer, I've left off microarchitecture layer because it needs a slide of its own. There's so many. But I thought I'd, I'd start with these. So approximate computing. Approximate computing to me is fascinating. Not the nonsense that you're seeing published uh, every place. In fact, there was a paper in ISCO last year where they wanted to approximate the, uh, uh, the executable image, the instructions. That's got to be the silliest thing I've heard. So you take an ad, which differs from a subtract by one bit. And if you get that bit wrong, you turn the ad into a subtract, and somehow the computer's going to do the right thing. I, I don't think so. Uh, the place where the approximate computing has gotten the most play is with JPEG. You know, lossy uh, pictures. You know, you can throw away more than half the pixels and still recognize the, the face. That's boring to me. That's not interesting. Sure, it's approximate computing, but so what? Uh, we've actually been doing approximate computing for a very long time. We used to call it floating point. That's approximate. In my view, approximate computing is one of those places where latency can really produce a big win if it's handled not by the architecture people alone, but by the architecture people combined with the algorithm people. And I think the algorithm people have the most uh, impact in that part of latency. I'll give me an example, a uh, traveling salesman. So the traveling salesman wants to visit 50 cities. Okay, so he goes and he takes out a sheet of paper and he puts down the 50 cities and he puts the distances between them and he computes what's the minimal city. Yeah. So he'll know how to minimize the time it takes him to visit all 50 cities in his travel. And of course, before he's got that computation done, it's time for him to retire. The latency is just too great. So that means that traveling salesmen never travel. No. What a traveling salesman does is comes up with an approximate computation of how to visit these 50 cities. And then he's on his way. So the latency is reduced dramatically because a traveling salesman doesn't even know he's solving uh, a approximately an MP complete problem. A traveling salesman is MP complete if you want the optimal. It's no longer MP complete if you're satisfied with something good enough. So there are a lot of places where we can take our algorithm, break it into pieces. In fact, the key idea here, which I have no idea how to do, is to break that algorithm into pieces so the pieces that don't have to be exact can be done approximately and thereby get the job done much, much faster. Save on the latency. Accelerators, that's another thing that accelerators shows up in almost every layer. Uh, if you look way down someplace, yeah, down at the bottom you'll see architecture layer, the EMT instruction. Uh, that's an instruction that was in the ISA of the PDP 11. What the EMT instruction stood for emulator trap. Back in the days of the PDP 11, many of you are probably not born yet. Uh, the machine um, specified and built by Digital Equipment Corporation, which later became Compact, which later became Hewlett Packard, which, I don't know, are you going to buy it with your new company, Kamal? Are you going to, I'm going to buy it, Hewlett Packard, you know. In fact, you know, I had a PhD student who took a job and he graduated with Tandem. And then Tandem was bought by Digital, so then he went for Digital. And then digital was bought by Compact, so they were for Compact, and Compact was bought by HP, they were for HP. 
He worked for four different companies without ever having to clean up his desk. I thought that was, <laughs> that, that, that was incredible. The EMT instruction allowed the programmer to specify an accelerator. What's an accelerator? I used to call them refrigerators in honor of William Perry, uh, a defensive tackle for one of our professional football teams in the American game of football. A player who most of the game was sitting on the, when the offense was on the field, was sitting on the bench powered off. But if the team was on the one foot line, they'd bring in William Perry in the ball. There's no way the defense could bring him to the ground. He would score a touchdown. Most of the game, he was sitting on the bench. He wasn't needed. He was an accelerator. When he was needed, he was really needed. In fact, uh, AMD, on their first wrist chip, had an instruction called Find First. It, that instruction took a bit pattern, a bit vector, and found the first bit that was set. Try to do that in software. Write a program to take a bit vector and find the first bit that's set. It'll take you tens of cycles. But if you have a bit vector and you're looking for the first bit that's set, you can do the logical design for that function. In fact, if any of you have taken a digital logic design course, probably did it when you were in kindergarten. Right? It's called a priority encoder. And AMD recognized that that was a useful thing to do, and it's better to make a, an accelerator, a piece of hardware, priority encoded to do that, rather than waste tens of cycles to do the job. So accelerators are things that will decrease latency. They will do it faster. Instead of tens of cycles to do fine first, it's a fraction of a cycle. Accelerators are the perfect example of the layers talking together. First, the algorithm person has to know that he needs it, he or she needs it. Second, the architecture has to specify it in the ISA. That was uh, Digital's EMT instruction. In those days, everything was done by microcode. So what the specifier would do would be to take this function and build it out of microcode, much faster than a sequence of instructions. You all know that. Microcode is faster than ISA. FPGAs are faster than microcode. ASICs are faster than FPGAs. So I needed each one of those layers, and the combination is that the piece of work I need to get done gets done uh, much faster, decreases the latency. At the language.